And it's extremely difficult for young males to overtly express affection. And competition becomes a way of having the intensity of friendship uh, unfold in a safe space. I'm Nathan Maharaj, and this is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is the novelist Richard Powers. Many readers will know him from his 2019 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Overstory, or perhaps The Echo Maker, which won the 2006 National Book Award. His newest novel is Playground, a story about four characters joined in different ways, marriage, friendship, even a kind of celebrity, but sharing nonetheless an interest in the French Polynesian island of Makatia, where residents are faced with a monumental decision for their future. Richard Powers, welcome to Kobo. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I want to start almost, I guess, before the book even starts with its dedication. Mm. One of the people to whom you dedicate this book is Peggy Powers Peterman, who gave you a book on coral reefs when you were 10 years old. Tell us about Peggy. So Peggy was my older sister, uh, three and a half years older than, than I am. Uh, and this gift that she gave me for my 10th birthday, I'd like to stress for the listeners that this was a very long time ago, 57 <laughs> years ago, more than a half a century. I don't know why she selected this book on Coral Reese to give me. I know that I was a little boy interested in everything having to do with science, every natural science on the planet. And she thought she'd get me interested in yet one more. Uh, she herself was a very playful, very capricious person, but she doted on me. I'm uh, the happy recipient of much uh, childhood and uh, adulthood love. Uh, and she thought that perhaps by by piquing my curiosity with this book that she might get me going down uh, another uh, long and winding road. Uh, we were living on the north side of Chicago at the time, uh, just on the northern edge of the city. And it was quite something to look out my window on you know, rows and rows of square blocks of brick Chicago bungalows, and then to look down at this book with its you know, psychedelic and surreal creatures, you know, that looked as if they'd come from another planet, and to say this is both, you know, the, both of these things are the Earth, <laughs> but I want to live on that Earth, mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I just figured uh, there was no way to get from from where I was to to the marvels of this book. Well, the next year, our father, who was a school principal uh, in Chicago. Uh, took a job at the International School of Bangkok. And so by my 11th birthday, one year later, I was actually swimming in the coral reefs of the uh, South China Sea among these creatures who I uh, knew so well from, from the book that Peg had given me. Incredible. Did you have to learn scuba diving or, or snorkeling to do this, or were you already a, a water kid by then? We snorkeled right away and... Uh, uh, there, there, there were many lovely reefs uh, where we would go uh, on the beaches near uh, near Bangkok. I did some scuba as well, uh, and from that age, from about eleven to sixteen, when I came back to the states, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to be a marine biologist. I mean, it was just I was obsessed with it. Uh, as it turns out, I got a little sidetracked, uh, but I did <laughs> come back to it vicariously, at least here uh, in in my uh, late sixties uh, with re with uh, writing this book, since a good uh, third of it is devoted to uh, the creation of a diver, a can French Canadian diver, who um, uh, gives gave me the chance while writing this book to remember to recreate. Uh, and also to vicariously enjoy many reefs where I had uh, never had the chance to to to, to dive. Mm. Uh, but this, you know, this book was not just uh, 
a recreation of that road that I never took, but it was a great recreation in remembering the oceans uh, from that time period, oceans that have been so uh, so badly damaged in the in the more than half century that has followed. Yeah, well, I'm I'm glad you you alluded to to the character in the book who's who plays this pivotal role in um, in the development of scuba. Um, Evie Beaulieu is the character. She's a marine biologist. Um, she's a pioneer, as I say, of scuba diving. She's also, I must note, uh, French Canadian, and mm -hmm. um, uh, which I which I loved. Um, she is the author of a book. Um, we're going to get to how that book falls into uh, an important character's hands. But first, I wanted to ask about this character of Evie Beaulieu, because this book takes place in what looks like history as we know it, but it's it's just a step aside. Um, mm. Jacques Cousteau does exist in the universe of, mm -hmm. of this book, um, but you didn't we didn't get a fictionalized Jacques Cousteau. This is instead some uh, something of a of a of someone following in those footsteps in in not just their love of the ocean, not just the research, but in then conveying it as well, being a communicator of of, mm -hmm. of this beauty to a mass audience. Um, tell me about Evie Beaulieu mm. and how uh, a very timid uh, little girl from Montreal at the end of the second. World War becomes one of the very first people on earth ever to use the aqualung. Yeah, well, uh, I guess uh, the the connection for me personally uh, started, I my wife uh, lived for many, many years in North Africa, in Tunisia, and uh, uh, she studied the literature, uh, the French literature of Algeria and Tunisia and was friends with a, a great number of francophone Maghrebis, many of whom ended up in Montreal. Uh, as you know, there's a there's a big connection uh, mm -hmm. between Algeria, Tunisia, and, and uh, Quebec. And uh, we would go up and, and uh, visit our friends, and that's where I fell in love with that remarkable city uh, and its, its polyglot qualities and its... Uh, it's amazing mix of people with all different backgrounds. And as I was researching for this book, knowing that it was going to be a book that concentrated on marine biology, and I began to read about Cousteau's invention of the aqualung, I was astonished and delighted to learn that he actually, his co-creator actually uh, relocated to Canada uh, mm. after the war and established a North American headquarters for the uh, development and manufacture of the Aqualung in Montreal. And I thought, here's my chance to, <laughs> uh, to, to tell a story that uh, connected my own uh, life to the, to this remarkable invention that opened up the, the oceans for human exploration in ways absolutely unimaginable prior to it. Tell me about Evie as as a character as you crafted her because she as you as you said she starts out she starts out timid she is she is mm -hmm. a a young girl without confidence and then when she crosses that that barrier from from air to underwater something changes she becomes yeah. herself yeah in the years just after the war you know uh, she has been traumatized by by the wartime experience and in in particular by the death of her uncle uh, who died in one of the uh, Canadian Navy's uh, encounters in the Pacific Operation Hailstorm near the Atoll of Truk. And the, uh, the death of her uncle actually uh, sends her mother into shock therapy and as a consequence of that, and perhaps uh, partly due to her own uh, uh, temperament, uh, she's afraid of everything. And she's afraid to step on the cracks in the sidewalk. She's afraid that the Virgin Mary is going to pop out of her cupboard at night and make her have religious revelations. You know, <laughs> she's just terrified of everything. And her father, who is an engineer working for uh, Gagnon in the manufacture of the, the first aqualungs, 
comes up with this plan that he's going to, to uh, ask her to be a tester of of the aqualung and he claims that they need to 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 determine whether someone of her size and and uh, a build can can use this device and of course it's just a scheme to try to give her something that she can be confident about and it, it succeeds beyond his wildest expectations she from her very first test dive in this uh, experimental pool in in the, an office building in Montreal she finds underwater a kind of comfort, a kind of grace, a kind of security that she never feel, never felt uh, in uh, the, the life on land, and is absolutely determined to make a life of diving. And of course, uh, much of the, her story is tied up with her having to blaze a trail, not just in this infant uh, domain, but. Uh, in a world mostly dominated by men, uh, and to to make a go of something uh, that is very difficult to to juggle with all the other expectations that are put upon women at this time. Mm -hmm. She does become something of a celebrity, partly by virtue of being being the only woman in the field, which isn't to say it's easy. Uh, the celebrity comes very late and is a double-edged sword to say the least mm. um it comes with a lot of intrusive questions and um uh challenges to her integrity and on on a variety of levels um but one of the things it yields is is this is this book and the reason i'm going to the book now is because honestly we could spend the, the all the time we have on any one of the characters in this quartet mm. so i'm mm. going to steer us gently I'm gonna, we're going to drift a little bit away i'm paddling ever so lightly away <laughs> <laughs> away from um evie i'm not even going to ask you about how much you had to learn about um quebec separatism to write her we're just gonna mm. we're just gonna drift away mm. because i want to ask about todd keen who is a character who receives a book um written by um evie Beaulieu. Uh, when he is 10 years old, but he is, he is not, uh, this is, this does not seem to be a character like you. This seems to be a character who shares a couple of incidental pieces and is really something of, uh, a, a quite a unique creation, especially as you represent him in the book, because I think he alone is the one who gives us first person narration, mm -hmm. but, but he's not speaking to us. Can you tell us though about, tell us about Todd Keen? Mm. So you're you're right. The book is divided between third person histories uh, and a first person narration by Todd Keene. Uh, Todd is a Chicago North Sider, something uh, he and I share. Uh, he, he his family, I, I would say, was a good deal wealthier than mine. His father was a trader on the uh, Chicago then what was then called the uh, Chicago Board of Trade. Um, trading commodities in the pit and uh, quite successful at it. Uh, the His father and mother and Todd live in what Todd calls the castle, which is one of these opulent uh, mansions on uh, the, uh, right on Lake Michigan in Evanston on the north side of Chicago. Uh, and Todd, uh, like me, uh, fell under the spell of a, of Evie's book at the age of 10 and uh, uh, becomes obsessed with the oceans, but gradually grows away from this uh, and is seduced by uh, the earliest personal computers. Uh, Todd's parents' marriage is horrific and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, dysfunctional in all kinds of creative and uh, <laughs> flamboyant ways. And uh, Todd's solution is to imagine himself under the water uh, and where, where, where the violence of his parents' interactions can't reach him. And that, that almost crypt-like quality of being uh, deep, you know, submerged deeply under, under the water in the, in the gloomy... Uh, oceanic feeling of uh, uh, you know, deep, deep diving. And uh, that's the, the appeal of Evie's book uh, grows out of this sense of 
um, uh, fascination with watery life. But when he comes into contact with the very first personal computers, his temperament is rescued in another way. Mm-hmm. His skill at making, at, at being able to write programs, uh, at uh, thinking formally and mathematically and getting these machines to do his bidding is so powerful, such a powerful experience for him that it creates a sense of s- solidity and stability uh, that he absolutely needs in his life, a sense of control and mastery uh, that... Uh, sweeps him along and actually uh, it provides the path uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, And he ultimately becomes one of the very first creators of a social media platform in the infinite internet uh, and ends up an extremely wealthy man. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to ask you about, I mean, that, that, that thing that he creates is playground and one of the one of the f- kind of fun things about reading this book is as i say it is it is our world but just one step to the side mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is at playground as as it comes up and and it comes up quite late when playground emerges when we get a sense of it it feels like reddit it feels like people should yeah. share a thing vote a thing up or down and then in the same timeline it turns out that todd is actually creating the precursor to the social web as we know it. And it includes mm-hmm. things like Reddit and Facebook and mm-hmm. all of those other things. Can you tell me a little bit about crafting this alternate history? Yeah, it was, it was uh, another uh, act of recreation on my part to, to, f- to create Todd's biography and to, to allow him to come of age in the very first years of the internet in fact he begins uh quite early and uh uh, in the days of the dial-up bulletin boards and it's only when he goes to college uh, down at the university of illinois where the first graphical web browser is created that uh, he sees the possibility of the networked world and because of his early start you know because he's Create, he's, he has cranked out uh, early software games uh, and sold them out of his garage in Ziploc bags, uh, basing a lot of his uh, coding expertise on the kinds of uh, games and puzzles and challenges that his father has raised him on. Uh, Todd is in a position to be a, to, to, to see what's happening and to take that nascent world of the of the dial-up bulletin boards and add a little oomph to it and get out early with a product that, as you say, uh, becomes something like uh, Reddit, something a little like Facebook, something like uh, MySpace or any of these early social media platforms. Uh, the difference is that his is gamified. Mm. Uh, there's a currency uh, that you can earn by by being on the site, by doing various activities on the site, and you can spend the currency to to interact and control your uh, presence on the white uh, on, on the site in various ways. And it's that gamification again that grows out of uh, his father's compulsion with games. You know that that uh, uh, he has. Uh, bestowed upon Todd that makes it just different enough to get traction and and take hold and become a dominant uh, uh, player in its field. Mm. And there are real stakes for Todd. I mean, as you mentioned, he he's born and his early childhood is is in he experiences wealth, he experiences great comfort and privilege. Um, but but um, if someone's listening very carefully and hasn't read the book, they'd, they'd wonder how did he end up at the university of Illinois? I mean, surely mm-hmm. that's not, that's not the path of America's most favored sons. Um, right. They, they fall on hard times and there is, there's a, there, there's good cause for Todd to work hard and, and fight for um, just in addition to his passion for games to actually fight for something that will make him a decent living um, mm. because, you know, he is, he, he's lucky to have a garage to sell, 
a game out of by by the time he's he's enrolling in university. And that's right. And there's a there was a, other motivations for him to end up at that university, uh, which at the time was among the the very best engineering and computer science uh, institutions in the country. Still is, mm. uh, but I needed to have him there because so much of the the uh, early internet the the uh, you know the as I say mosaic the first graphical browser was created in Illinois and the 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 people who would have been in school at the same time with Katad mm. went out to to build out you know what we now take for granted as the you know as, as several of the primary uh, you know uh, software apps uh, YouTube for instance the creator went to Illinois so mm. a, a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of the need to have Todd in that place was simply to make sure that he could get that jump that he needed to get to get in and establish his his app uh, as uh, as an early uh, pre- uh, yeah. competitor in this field. Uh, he, uh, I need to back up just a little bit yeah. and in, introduce uh, a third uh, character from this quartet. Uh, Todd attends an elite high school on the south side of Chicago, uh, an actual institution that uh, is is a venerable old Chicago uh, secondary school. And he meets there uh, someone his same age Mm -hmm. uh, who's coming from very different circumstances, uh, Rafi Young, who's a south side uh, black kid uh, whose family uh, is barely holding it together his father's a fireman his mother drives buses for uh, the chicago transit authority uh rafi has come to this elite school saint ignatius uh, uh through a very different path and he and todd bond over both having very dysfunctional families over both being uh extremely brainy kids yeah. Uh, yeah. Their dads yeah. are hard men. Both their fathers are both hard driving men who were trying to shape their sons. And uh, uh, they recognize that they're also both, t- t- you know, horribly outside uh, in the, the main preoccupations of high school society. They're definitely uh, isolated nerds. Uh, and they both have a love of board games. Mm-hmm. And their friendship is held together by this need to compete with each other, the need to dominate each other, to, to, to uh, be the superior player, first of chess, uh, later of Go, and later mm-hmm. still various exotic uh, German-style uh, games uh, from you know when, when Euro games uh, start creating this renaissance of board gaming, mm-hmm. of, of complex, low-luck, high-skill, board gaming uh and it's really uh something we didn't say about the the origin of todd's uh creation it's really the interaction between these two boys uh and a a series of of fateful fateful conversations that makes todd hit upon this idea to gamify his creation and make it very different from all the other kinds of uh, platforms for networked communication that were existing at this time. So Mm -hmm. in some very real way, it's Rafi who is highly suspicious of everything that Todd loves in computing and in uh, mathematics and in, in formal thinking and who instead has found his salvation and his stabilization in literature first in poetry and then then in novels uh it's really rafi who gives todd the key to make making his work something special and that of course drives plot complications as the boys uh the push-pull friendship of the boys spins out as they enter into adulthood it's such an interesting relationship they have because they are so lit up by one another Mm. And the fact that they are, that what bonds them is competition. Mm -hmm. And it's this curious competition where neither wants to win decisively because that would be so unsatisfying. (laughs) They really revel in how 
each challenges the other. Um, when they, you know, when they, they, they master chess and then, and then the, the, then go comes upon them and they marvel at not just how difficult it is, but also how they'll never play the same match twice. They'll never even play close to the same match twice. If they, if they, mm. if they choose to, um, mm -hmm. it's such a fascinating relationship. I guess I wonder about, um, how naturally that came to you. Well, on the one hand, uh, I wanted to talk about the complexities of male friendship, mm. especially young male friendship, and how difficult it is for two intense kids who really latch on to each other as almost you know, mutual salvations, uh, how difficult it is for them to be comfortable with the intense emotions that friendship brings. And it's extremely difficult for young males uh, to, to overtly express affection, uh, or it can be, mm. uh, and competition becomes a way of having the intensity of friendship, uh, unfold in a safe space in the kind of magic circle of the game. Uh, and the game also allows them to be philosophical with, with each other. They both have this uh, desire to be expansive and to speculate about things way beyond their own experience. And contemplating this cosmic, uh, uh, complex, and inexhaustible game of Go allows them to, to be kind of raw and exposed and, and open with each other uh, in ways that it would otherwise be difficult to be when it's just you know, real life. Uh, so they're, they 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 let themselves uh, wax philosophical about uh, colored stones on a board, uh, and allow that to be their metaphorical way about talking about the complexities and difficulties of their own lives. That said, I have to go back to where you started the conversation, which is uh, the dedications of the book, and beneath the dedication to my sister is another dedication, and I think careful readers we'll be able to infer that uh, Rafi is very much an homage to a lifelong friendship that I've had with someone uh, whose life I drew heavily on in the creation of this character. So in many ways, uh, again, not just a, 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 a recreation of uh, my own uh, path and the important, the people who have been important to me along the way, but a recreation in turning uh, those people and uh, myself and our interactions into something fictional and into something entirely different. Mm. It's such a gift to be so well loved. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I think one of the one of the great pleasures of the reflective life of fiction writing is to go back to different periods of your past, uh, which sometimes our lives encourage us. Uh, to uh, to let go in our constant obsession with the future, becoming something new and going into you know uh, new new terrain and continuing to grow means uh, letting old things uh, drift away. Well, writing is a constant return, a constant reflection, a re a recovery, and a reinterpretation of uh, all uh, previous chapters. Of life and and to me, it's it's incredible enrichment to remember what my sixty seven years have contained and to find stories uh, that can allow me for a while to um, to just bask in the in in all of these uh, you know, experiences and to turn them into something new and strange and you know, to, to savor them again as, uh, as fiction this time. Mm. One thing that's not fictional, if I can, if I, if I can make an awkward segue, the island mm -hmm. of Makatia, it's a real place. Mm -hmm. It's, it's where a lot of the story takes place. And as I said, in the intro, um, this is an island, uh, where its residents face a, a really big decision. Um, and for full disclosure, I have not finished the book. I read up to the point where they're about to take the vote. It's quite late in the book. It is. Mm -hmm. it, so I, I don't know. I don't know how it, how it comes out. Um, so I am incapable. I am inoculated against spoiler. You, 
Yeah, no, <laughs> well, that's marvelous, but I'm also very excited because uh, uh, something happens in the final pages of the book uh, that uh, uh, that for me was quite wonderful uh, to, uh, to to find my way toward, but mm. I think uh, really changes uh, uh, everything that has come up until then, until yeah. I, I was in, 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 at least I hope that it will do that for you. I'm sure it's a, a device um, cleverly sprung. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was 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 this decision that that these people on Makatia face. Uh, I guess I would start by asking, can you tell us a little bit about this island and why it was the place to bring into the story? So I have uh, been lucky to visit Polynesia uh, several times over the course of my life. Uh, and orienting toward the Pacific, living in Southeast Asia, uh, I have, have always had a, a fascination with the way that that uh, ocean was uh, populated. And in particular, I, I, um, in my early 20s, when I first started writing books, I came across the story of the uh, Pacific Phosphate Islands. There's a there's a small number of islands. Um, Nauru is probably the most famous. Banaba and Makatea. Um, they uh, these islands were discovered to have large concentrations of phosphate in rock form, and it was their undoing, because as the world population was taking off in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, uh, the the need to fill these uh, to feed these burgeoning populations was uh, increasing, and uh, phosphate as an essential component of fertilizer was uh, much sought after, and these islands were literally consumed. Uh, they the, the extraction industries that. Uh, set upon them, removed vast amounts of these tiny islands uh, in order to export them around the world uh, to, to use as fertilizers. And this created a, a great trauma for the, uh, for the inhabitants of these islands, in particular in Polynesia, the idea of land, you know, the, the word is fenua, uh, is so essential. Uh, it's almost like uh, there's this strong umbilical connecting a person to the place where they started. And to see that externalized part of you mm. uh, be dug up and shipped off to other parts of the world, it's like having your own body spread around the world. Uh, so, uh, Makatea, uh, the, when the mines were uh, at peak production, probably had a population of several thousand people, uh, at least uh, 3,000 and uh, at, at times uh, somewhat higher. After the mines were shut down in the mid-1960s, uh, that population crashed to under 100 people. So you have an island that has, has a rich cultural history. Uh, you, you plunder it and... Uh, you leave it, you abandon it with a tiny number of people who are left uh, to make a subsistence living on a place that's an environmental disaster. Now, uh, I always thought that would be a very dramatic story, mm. uh, a, a kind of a colonial collision that isn't widely known. Uh, and I never got around to writing that per se. But not long ago, I became fascinated with uh, many of the uh, grandiose uh, conceptions for the future that were coming out of Silicon Valley, where I was living at the time. I had a, uh, a professorship at Stanford and, uh, you know, was living in Palo Alto, right in the heart of Silicon Valley, and regularly meeting these people uh, who's, uh, who had created the present with the digital revolution and were very happily and energetically uh, creating a future uh, that sometimes seemed horrific to me. I would go to dinner parties and there would be these uh, transhumanist uh, 
tech bros saying things like, you know, don't get sick, uh, eat healthily, you know, go running, exercise every day, hold on for just a few more years, because we're going to cure the design flaw of death. We're going to we're going to fix the problem with human life by uh, completely uh, er eradicating uh, death and diminishment. Uh, we're going to we're going to master uh, genetics and uh, biology, and we're all going to live young and healthy forever. And you know, to to see this as a as a serious topic of conversation mm -hmm. and uh, energetically pursued vision of the future was so astonishing to me uh, that I felt, oh, you know, this this has to be at the heart of the books that I'm writing about where we are and and you know what world is being created for us. And when I learned just a few years ago about this enterprise called seasteading, which is the creation of modular floating platforms that can be combined and recombined in various ways uh, to create small floating uh, towns or small cities uh, uh, on the surface of the ocean. Um, and the way in which this had become uh, such a cause for people in Silicon Valley, in particular, the, the famous venture capitalist, Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, uh, you know, here's, here's another way of talking about uh, collision of world visions. And when I learned that Peter Thiel and his consortium had actually signed a letter of intent with the government of French Polynesia, there I was back in the story of the phosphate uh, islands, and it had to be Makatea where this story unfolded. And so here's an island that has already been brought to its knees by a first uh, experience of colonialism, mm -hmm. who is now presented with a new proposal. That is, would you like to become a base for the manufacture of these modules for the creation of these floating cities? To, to put that to the small number of, of inhabitants who are still on that island, who now have to decide whether this is their salvation. Uh, you know, could this be the hospital that they need? Could this yeah. be the schools that will allow them to keep their children on the island? Could this be the livelihood that would make the island viable again? Or is it just colonialism round two? Is it just another form of imperial exploitation? Mm. That forms so much of the heart of the political crisis of, uh, of the book. Mm. What, what is it that attracts the seasteaders? Because we don't, we don't hear from them. The book um, doesn't, uh, we are very much in the position of the Islanders. This, this seasteading proposition is coming at us from outside as well. We are, we are much more, our feet are much more planted on Makatea than, than in anywhere else. What, why why mm -hmm. do the seasteaders want this? This is uh, <laughs> you say Peter Thiel, so I'm instantly I'm thinking, oh, there's got to be something about marine law. There's like being yeah. free of of constraint. For sure, that is the uh, central motivation and the dream uh, that these floating cities will uh, sail out beyond the 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 line of of. Uh, the, in the 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 national boundary of these island states, and be out in open waters where regulation is minimal, and they won't be beholden to any existing government, and they'll be able to make new political configurations of their own. So this dovetails perfectly with the libertarian desire to escape all regulation, and uh, you know, the you know to build a future that uh, is in no way impeded by uh, accountability to human social systems. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't help but think about the, um, about the, the mantra that Todd, um, uh, Todd leads his business with about, um, oh, what is it? It's about, I wish I'd written it down. It was about, it's that to, to break the rules they hadn't thought to write yet. <laughs> right, right, right. Of course, I'm playing with uh, Zuckerberg's famous uh, move fast and break things, uh, which, uh, uh, although they've withdrawn that as an official motto, I think still characterizes uh, so much of, of that culture. Uh, 
you know, there's a moment uh, toward the end of the book where Todd uh, is forced uh, to give testimony uh, to Congress uh, in Washington ab about, you know, why should your platform, uh, you know, of all the human industries, uh, have have no accountability? Why should things be allowed to happen on your platform uh, that uh, uh, if they, you know, if they appeared in a newspaper or a magazine would be instant libel or, or mm. uh, uh, and, and, and his answer was, of course, Zuckerberg's answer, we're, we're not a medium we're just a platform yeah right? just so so right just a structure uh, out at sea beyond yeah, the law yeah and uh uh he, he the, the the congresswoman then asks him uh you know a while ago uh uh you you talked about uh uh, being destroyers of of uh, social stability, do you still call yourself that? And he says, "No, we're we're using destabilizers now, right?" Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, that this this allows me to obliquely talk through this fiction to obliquely address the question of how our society has ended up in this incredible place where. We are at war with ourselves. Uh, we have decided that truth isn't that important, that uh, uh, if we can find a community of like-minded people uh, uh, and who are willing to attach themselves to anything, any kind of conspiracy theory or fantasy or invented reality, that we too can become part of that community. Uh, it, it allows me to come in the back door and raise this question about to what extent these unregulated platforms uh, are the, the place where this social division was allowed to gestate and germinate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to run out of time here before we talk about the one character we haven't spoken of, mm. Ina Aroita, who, right. who we meet, we meet walking on a beach, um, with one of her children, uh, at the beginning, she is an artist, uh, and throughout the book, she's working on a project, um, which ties to the exploitation and neglect of, of the South Pacific and, and other places. Tell us about Ina a little bit. So. Todd and Rafi meet Eno when she comes to Illinois to do her collegiate work as a as a sculptor. Uh, and by the time of the present of the book, she has gone back to Polynesia. Her mother is Tahitian, uh, and she's gone back uh, to 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 live on this uh, island not far from Tahiti. Uh, for reasons that aren't clear until the end of the book, uh, she she runs away from the United States and returns to, to Polynesia. Uh, and as you say, uh, she uh, has turned her attention to this very unusual medium, which is plastic washing up on the islands. And this, this grew out of... Uh, my research and while i was reading so much about the oceans and so much about that area i was astonished and appalled to hear the statistics and see the the, the uh, photographs and the video of just how much even the most remote most isolated most beautiful pacific island paradise has become uh the, the dumping ground for uh, the, the immense amount of plastic floating around through the world's oceans. Uh, I read the statistic that uh, more than a million tons of plastic fishing, uh, plastic fishing net alone entered the ocean every year. And uh, the, 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 the idea of these you know, islands that we still think about as pristine and untouched because they're so far from the rest of the world, actually being tied in to the behaviors and the lifestyles of the rest of the world uh, in this in this way uh, was you know was so uh, 
uh, such powerful image to me that I thought, why not make this woman uh, discover in plastic a medium that she can use for assemblages that would be uh, that would not only give her the same creative satisfaction that working in other media did, but allow her to speak directly in this form to what's happening to her island and all the islands uh, in, in the Pacific and, and near her home. And what's happening to her island is, is um, it's put to a vote. The, the residents are, um, they're going to decide, they're going to make a decision. Um, the mayor of the island uh, leads a debate in which um, they're deciding who will be enfranchised. And I thought this was so interesting because it uh, reminded me as, as they talked about, you know, if you can sign your name, then maybe you should be able to vote because you're going mm -hmm. to live with us a long time. It's, it's, um, uh, it's going to be generational. It's going to be multi-generational. So what it means is children will get to cast a vote. And before, before the book carried on through the debate, and it is a, it's a wonderful tight little scene where we really get all sides of, of why this is a good idea, why it's a terrible idea, why it's exactly the same idea as giving adults the vote, because everyone's, mm. everyone's got their priors and everyone's got their influences. Mm. Mm. What it first did though, was reminded me of your previous novel, The Bewilderment, which mm. is a book so concerned with the care uh, and well-being of children. Um, so, you know, w without, without, you know, spoiling the book for me, because I don't know how the vote turns out. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about, about that concern for children and, and how, how you find yourself um, bringing it into your work. So bewilderment was my way of telling story uh, about the epidemic of, of climate anxiety uh, and how intense and widespread and pervasive it is uh, among young people and how very different it is for someone, uh, some adult who's lived most of their, their life uh, to feel anxious about the future and, uh, you know, as compared to uh, what it feels like for a 10 year old or a 12 year old or a 15 year old uh, to confront the, the future and how in how it is so much uh the responsibility and the the uh the failure of people my age um that you know results in this alienation and the, this this overwhelming anxiety that young people feel and how much anger they must feel how much uh resentment that we failed uh, to stave off the consequences that they will now uh, spend their life confronting. And the, the idea that we have externalized our costs uh, mm -hmm. to the next generation is at the heart of that book. And it also comes into play, as you say, on Maktea, when they begin to explore who should actually be able to vote about the future of the island. Shouldn't it be those people who will bear the brunt of the choice? And, and then there's one more step to this question of uh, who gets to vote. Uh, after it's hashed out that uh, since the children will be living with the consequence of the vote so much longer and uh, more completely than the adults, uh, someone else on the island raises this question, what about all the other creatures mm. whose own existences will be so severely impacted by this choice. Uh, what about the, the, the creatures of the land, the creatures of the reef around the island? Their entire existence is also thrown into question by our decision whether or not to turn our island into a manufacturing headquarters, a hub. And so this question of the rights of nature enters in as well. And of course, I explored that quite a bit in the overstory. Um, mm. If, if you need to be a human being, uh, to be a plaintiff in a lawsuit, who is going to speak on behalf of all the, the more than human creatures uh, and the, the rich, complex ecosystems uh, 
uh, who we, we routinely uh, uh, alter, decimate, change, sometimes eradicate uh, in the interests of human future. So uh, to raise this question of, of the community of agents and living things uh, on the island and in the waters off the island, their interdependence, their interconnection, and to once again try to find a story that says, look, we make decisions as if we're the only thing here uh, you know, uh, of consequence. Uh, we need to change the way we think about what it means to be human and to live on this earth. We need to rejoin a much larger consortium of interested parties uh, before you know, we decide to take control over the future of, of all things beyond us. Richard, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Nathan. It's a pleasure to talk. I have been speaking with Richard Powers, author of the new novel, Playground. Find it and his other books at Kobo and Conversation's home on the web, kobo.com slash conversation. There is a link in the show notes. Subscribe in your podcast player to catch every episode. And if you like this one, tell the most playful book lover you know. Kobo in Conversation is produced and hosted this time by me, Nathan Maharaj, uh, with apologies to the esteemed institution, the University of Illinois. I, I mean you no disrespect. I, you, you do great work. Uh, it's just ripping you a little bit. Thank you so much for listening.